Good morning, everybody. Um, we're going to start with a story. For a little while earlier this year, those of you that follow me on Twitter have seen this, my team was playing a C++ game. Uh, we never came up with a good name for it, but I might call it something like, everything is terrible, the game. Or maybe, the code review training game. Or maybe just, ugh. The gist of this game is simple. Come up with the biggest feature in C++, either language or library, that does not require any warning signs. Like, if the junior dev on your team started using that feature just all the time, just wildly, what is the scary story that you tell them to temper their enthusiasm? Right? So to play this game, you toss out such a feature, and the other players around the table, this is maybe done over coffee or beer, uh, produce details, examples, scary stories, to show that your feature maybe isn't perfectly safe in all cases. Right? If nobody can come up with such a feature, or the examples aren't good or whatever, and the table agrees that your feature is bigger than any previous winner, then you are in the lead. Play until you stop playing. For example, you might be not trying very hard, and you might say, move semantics. Right? Now, this is not disparaging move semantics. Right? Move semantics is a great feature, right? wild performance improvements everywhere. But we would have good answers to someone saying move semantics. Like, there's use after move. You should be aware of that. You should be a little worried about that. Right? There will never, ever be perfect static detection of use after move because of a function like this. Right? This is a function that takes a vector by reference, an offset, and a Boolean, and based on these runtime things, conditionally moves one element out of that vector. Right? Static analysis literally has no chance. Right? Or you can have things like the standard library suggests that all, well, by default, standard library types are left in a valid but unspecified state, right? which makes perfect sense from the committee's perspective. That is the thing to do for this language. But it is hardly satisfying for someone that is coming to C++ cold. Of course, the point of this game is not really to win. It is to have this discussion. Right? It is mostly a motivator to swap stories and train people to be on the lookout for all of the goofy edge cases. How about std function? Right, let's play. Are there areas here that are worth calling out? Like, What are the tripping hazards for something that is as simple as std function? Right, anyone? Raise your hands. They could be empty. They could be empty, yep. The arguments may have different lifetime. Maybe. I could imagine that. Sean, I think your hand went up. No? Hanging references. Yeah, hang, dangling references are yeah, possible. It's a little hard. Copying large closures. Copying large closures definitely comes up. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Dynamic allocation depending on the size. It may dynamically allocate depending on the size of the callable, all of these things. Yeah, like there are things that you sort of need to be aware of. Not all the time, right? Most of the time, this is going to be fine, right? But there are things that you should keep in the back of your mind when you're discussing this, when you're thinking about this, when you're using this aggressively. When I was coming up with these slides, I can think of three. Right, so one, it requ requires your callables to be copyable. Uh, so for instance, in uh, 14 and on, you can bind something into your lambdas by name. Um, this gives you the ability to actually bind a unique pointer into your lambda. Uh, now that lambda is obviously not copyable because internally it is holding a move only type. So that lambda has now become move only. And you can't assign a std function to that because the underlying callable has to be copyable. Right? Arguably, this is a fine choice, except it actually seems in practice like surprisingly often you want to give ownership of a thing to a callable so that when that callable is called, or even just when that callable goes out of scope, your lifetime is resolved, your ownership is resolved. Right? So maybe std function is fine, but we also need a thing that is just move only. Right? I hear questions about this kind of all the time. There is also some performance cost to it, because it has value semantics and type erasure. Uh, it may allocate in some cases. Std function has slightly higher overhead than you might have with just a lambda directly concepts or other 
template-based callable machinery, uh, even in some cases something like function ref that is going through standardization now. And std function is broken with respect to const correctness. It's kind of a little subtle and bothersome to me, but um, generally if you've got a value type, uh, something that's copyable, it owns its data, all of that, when it's cost, const, rather, you can't do anything to what it contains, right? You can't modify what's underneath it. Uh, and yet in this case, right, this code actually builds just fine, right? I have a callable with two operations on it. You cannot call the const call operator on this callable, and the non-const one is definitely mutating something, uh, and yet I can assign a const std function and invoke it, and that's a little surprising, right? For comparison, if you looked at this with uh, optional or vector, right, this clearly doesn't work. This is a build break, right? The rest of std functions operators are rigged as if it were a regular type, but in this one weird way, it smells like a normal value type, but it has this lurking const correctness or thread safety bug. The first two things on this list feel like surprising, only slightly surprising results of a reasonably well thought out design, right? The last one here feels like a bug, all of which is a fairly long way of motivating the question, who here thinks that the committee is infallible? Raise your hands. Let the record show. <laughs> one goofball in the back was joking, <laughs> and that's it, right? So if we aren't infallible, then we are going to make mistakes from time to time, hopefully rarely. Right? I very much liked what Sean said yesterday of we should move slowly and gather input and like figure out what we're doing and not necessarily try to take big steps, right? But if we are going to make mistakes, that leads us immediately to the next question of how does the committee fix mistakes? or even how should the committee fix mistakes? Right? We've all heard the Silicon Valley cliche, you wanna move fast and break things. And that clearly works great at some level when you're producing web applications. You're like, oh no, there's a bug. I guess we push a new version of the PHP code or whatever. Right? But how do we move fast and break things when we are a programming language, when we are a foundation, when we are the platform on which all else is built? Right? Move fast and break things works great for apps but not so much for foundations and platforms. People are relying on you very aggressively not to break things. If you go all the way back to the early years of the language, or I assume any successful language, uh, an awful lot of effort was spent on keeping backwards compatibility. Right? Bjarna mentions this regularly in the early chapters of Design and Evolution, uh, which you should all read. Apparently the theme of the keynotes here is reading homework. Uh, but in order to not lose users to other upstart languages in the early days, as new features were added, Bjarna paid great care to ensure that existing programs did not have to change except in extraordinary circumstances. And back during those early days where backwards compatibility was first being discussed, there were probably dozens, maybe even hundreds of C++ programs, right? There might have even been a million lines of code Asking for a rewrite of all of that code would have, to accept a new feature would have been asking for a lot. These days I estimate that there's probably somewhere upwards of 50 billion lines of C++ code. There's probably not a trillion lines of C++ code. Probably, right? It's sort of my error bars on that. But we'll be conservative here for the sake of argument and just say 50 billion. What percentage of that is legacy? How do we even define that? Let's, let's start there. For my purposes, I'm going to say code that was written before the current standard or in a dialect before the current standard uh, that won't necessarily be edited or refactored to take advantage of recent changes, stuff that works fine as it is and isn't being tinkered with. Right? My gut says, percentage-wise, that is definitely less than half of all code. I think at least half of our code is still like being evolved as we go. Right? So it's less than 25 billion, but I would say it's definitely more than 5%. There's a lot of old stuff out there. Um, if we say 10, that seems plausible to me, and that's what my slides say, so we're going to go with that. Uh, it still seems fairly conservative, right? But that does mean we have 
maybe five billion lines of code that exists today works fine and will continue to work without being tinkered with in C++. Now, maybe once in a great while, someone will mount an expedition to go fix some latent bug in there, but by and large, we can pretend that this code is done. Right? That's kind of cool. For comparison, the Linux kernel is roughly 20 million lines of code. Windows is reputed to be 50 million. The code base I help maintain at Google is 250 million lines of Google-authored C++ code, no third-party stuff. And Google as a whole is about 2 billion uh, for everything across languages, third-party code, open source code, all of that stuff. Um, so we're saying that there's two or three Googles worth of C++ code out there that works fine and would never be touched again. It may be stable indefinitely if the committee doesn't force some change upon it. Right? That's five or six orders of magnitude more code than Bjarne was worried about when he started down the path of, we're going to try to make sure to not break things. So that's the problem that we face, right? The committee makes mistakes, and as time marches on, even just the definition of legacy changes, right? There is probably now legacy code that is written in C++ 11. Right? That's an interesting thought. And as we, and we, as a committee, we worry about all of this. We really do. Like way back in 2014, I lobbied for a change to std function to make it not so broken with respect to const correctness. I didn't know how to talk about that problem quite as well as I should have, uh, and the change was not accepted. But largely, the change was not accepted because we were worried about the scope of that breakage. Right? So for comparison, how many of you were using C++11 professionally in 2014? Raise your hands. That is about half. It's not so bad. Keep your hands up if you were using std function as a vocabulary type at that point. That's about five people. Keep your hands up if you want a const std function to preferentially call the non-const call operator. Yeah. <laughs> Sean, maybe. Sean, maybe. OK. Uh, so that's, that's sort of where I was, right? Uh, but we were worried about the scope of the breakage. We didn't take that change. I suspect that the in-practice scope of that breakage uh, was pretty close to zero at the time. And literally everything I've ever seen where that would be a problem is a bug. Uh, it is now manifestly worse. It would be harder to fix. Right? And to be fair, right, breaking a build is sort of a rough thing. Right? This is not a nice solution to anything. Given the layering and network expansion of dependencies in modern software, if you break the build for some project, it is not just the devs of that project that are affected. On average, you wind up affecting all of the downstream dependencies as well. And that is a pretty good way to annoy users, right? They did nothing wrong, but they are affected by choices made by a project they depend on, or a project that depends on, or the language that everything is written in, right? That is not a great way to win hearts and minds. So it is very reasonable to prioritize backwards compatibility aggressively. So much code, right? Five billion lines conservatively works fine as it is. Breaks have a super linear blast radius, right? It is mostly bystanders that are affected when you break someone's build, not direct offenders. We've always prioritized backwards compatibility. That is quite possibly a big part of why C++ actually caught on in the first place. And this all is why Herb and Bjarne talk about evolving the language without breaking backwards compatibility. The C++ core guidelines, which are great, are part of the general strategy. We're going to extend the language and then tell people to stay away from the icky parts. This is the uh, subset of a superset approach. The icky parts are still there, but only the curated and well-tested subset of the newly expanded language will be used for new code. Old stuff works. New stuff is safer and easier. Everyone wins. This is the stability argument. Let's look at the other side of the coin. We know, or accept for the sake of argument, that the committee makes mistakes. Right? We know that C++11 has at least some mistakes in it. I think std bind, uh, my argument for std function. Uh, does the older chunk of the language also contain things that we wish we could change? This makes it time for scary stories with Titus. We'll start with one that I presented in my talk on SD8 at CppCon last month. Uh, 
if you were there, don't blurt it out. I don't think the video's up yet, so otherwise it should be good. Who sees how this code might be risky when you are upgrading from one version of the language to another? Nobody? I'll give you a hint. It's one of the scary three-letter acronyms in C++. No, not STL. <laughs> You're not helping. It is my old nemesis, ADL. All right, if we provide a standard version of contains with a similar signature, your code will become ambiguous, best case. Uh, hopefully, it's just a build break. It is also possible, with some type conversion trickery in your definition of contains, for our newly introduced version to become a better match via ADL than what you had, even though you are calling the thing that looks like it's just in your, you think you are calling the thing <laughs> that is in your namespace. Right? This could silently become a behavioral change. Right? Note the implied order of arguments between these two function signatures. Right? I have swapped those two. Right? Uh, if my version in the standard library is a better match than yours, you are in for a world of hurt, my friend. Right? This is going to be hard to track. Right? ADL is short for argument dependent lookup, and it is wild. When given an unqualified function call, one with no colon colons in it, uh, we look in the current scope and all enclosing scopes, exactly what you think, and then, drum roll please, the associated namespaces of all arguments and template parameters. Right? This means that when you write contains without any qualifiers, a function call that passes any standard type is going to do overload resolution on the functions of that name in your namespace, in parent namespaces, and in std. Or actually, because it is about arguments, you can also get this if you are accepting a type that is convertible from a standard argument and someone invokes it with an argument. Right? It's really hard. Right? If you want to be well protected from ADL issues when you are upgrading from one version of a library to another, you had better not have any unqualified function calls that accept arguments convertible to the library that is being upgraded. Right? I described this rule in my SD8 talk as no unqualified calls to snake case functions that accept arguments of standard types which is frankly not the type of rule that people will generally understand or obey, right? This is buck wild, right? Okay, so, but this is totally legit, right? And if you ask anyone on any of my teams, like, what is the worst thing about trying to do maintenance in our large code base? Uh, number one answer is probably ADL. So ADL is weird and maybe risky. Doesn't prove that legacy C++ has issues that we want to fix, but we're definitely seeing that there's maybe some creepy areas here. So, what else we got? How about this? We've decided to be efficient and make the same function contains an inline function so that we can get that good, good inlining optimization. And because I threw out that scary bit earlier about providing the arguments in the wrong order, we're going to have a half solution to that and assert that the sizes here aren't backwards. Depending on your build practices, this may be a bug. Or let me rephrase that. For many, maybe most people, this has a bug. Can you spot it? I said something about build practices. This actually boils down to one question. Do you build all consistently? The trick here is that if you rebuild everything in your program, including all of your libraries, with the same definitions and the same build flags, then you're fine, right? If you don't, then you are skating on thin ice because it is really easy to violate the one definition rule. In this particular instance, the issue is the assert, right? That whole line is nothing when built in production mode and actually does the assertion in debug mode, which means if you build part of your binary in debug mode, say you're trying to investigate a crash, and leave the rest of it in opt mode so that you can get to said crash quickly, but both parts actually include this header, 
you have violated ODR. Your program is ill-formed. You have UB. All bets are off. Nasal demons, arbitrary badness, right? And now I'll come back to that. Uh, note that this is about definitions, not declarations, right? And the one definition rule is sort of what it sounds like, right? Everything that is used has to be defined at least once. Depends a little bit on the type of the thing. Some things, variables, functions, must be declared or defined exactly one time. Other things, class templates, uh, classes, templates, inline functions, may be defined more than once so long as they are token for token identical in every definition and they mean the same thing every time they are evaluated. You can't have overload resolution go to a different place uh, in a different like inclusion of that header. Right? Uh, definitions really, really have to match. Right? So you violated ODR in the previous example if you built in a not entirely principled fashion because that assert was there in one version and not there in the other. Right? So why do we have this rule? Is this just the committee being a bunch of big jerks and making things hard for you? No, it isn't, right? It really isn't. Uh, in a lot of respects, I think the ODR rule is an early version of us just acknowledging we can give you better things, but you might abuse them, right? If you make it really easy and obvious for the compiler that there are two things of the same name, there is not a problem, and that is because we want to help you, right? If you just have these two lines of code, yes, that is a build break, right? That is, again, ODR. But you have to keep in mind C++'s heritage and the ideas of separate compilation and linking. If we build foo.cc and bar.cc with separate invocations of the compiler, how is this possibly going to work? Right? It is really important to note exactly the way that ODR manifests. When you violate ODR by providing multiple incompatible definitions for the same thing, that is, in the spec, ill-formed, no diagnostic required, NDR. Your program isn't required to compile, but the compiler also isn't required to produce a diagnostic because it is strictly too hard for us to do so. It is absolutely a bug, not just implementer freedom to optimize or whatever. There is no semantically consistent way to put all of these pieces together in the same program. Your program is nonsense. So you could say, well, even if it's built separately, we could still add a step to the linker to identify redefinitions. But I'll say, as soon as the compiler starts doing constant folding, right, even just basic levels of constant folding, it stops being clear that those variables even exist, right? And that's just one of the things, yeah. Uh, those are just the basic things where the rule isn't easy, there must be only one, right? When we get to templates or inline functions, that's even weirder, right? Checking that those are actually token for token the same in every TU, every translation unit, starts to look an awful lot like reparsing and recompiling. That's not gonna work, right? All of which is to say, ODR is the way that we, the committee, the standard, the compilers, right, say, hey, don't do weird things, right? We're gonna assume pretty hard that when we see a thing in one translation unit, that is the same as a thing of the, another, a thing of the same name in another translation unit, right? We're gonna optimize along those lines. Right? We're going to allocate space for those things along those lines. We're going to constant fold along those lines. We're going to assign addresses to things along those lines. Right? You will get faster compilation time if you don't make us enforce that, and you'll get better optimization when we can assume that. And we can't even issue a diagnostic reliably. We can't break your build when you mess this up because of separate compilation. Right? This is a language that does not allow for there to be overhead if someone could conceivably not need it, right? A well-behaved programmer shall not pay for the cost in compilation time or runtime to prevent this. So we're going to assume that you're not doing this, which means there is no visible evidence for you when you break this rule that you are actually working with nonsense. Scary thought. ODR is going to be a monster in the general case until at least modules is everywhere. It might still be a pitfall in a modules world, 
I think it is maybe too soon to be sure on that point, but for at least the foreseeable future, even things as innocuous looking as an assert in a header represent a surprisingly dangerous potential bug. It'll probably work fine. It certainly won't issue a diagnostic, but if something goes wrong, then you are in for a world of painful debugging where nothing makes any sense. I will take that as my opportunity to remind you, build everything from source with the same flags at the same time if possible. Am I saying that ODR is a bug or fundamentals of C++ are broken? I am not. I do not think that we can do any better. Mostly I bring it up for one critical reason. You're probably violating this, and your code is probably what I would call happens to be working. It is not right, but the wrongness hasn't manifested yet in a way to hold you back. C++ is that type of language. Because we cannot pay for runtime diagnostics on these sorts of things, you can, and often do, have code that is completely, completely illegal and maybe happens to work. Understanding that, really understanding how likely it is that a given library is happens to work as opposed to actually bug-free really makes me think about legacy code differently. Other people on the committee will say to me, well, this code has been out there forever and works fine, and I hear, well, this code has been out there forever, maybe its bugs have been tracked down, maybe they're just still asleep. In practice, I work with very good programmers, and I see a ton of happens to work, and very little actually correct. It is just far, far too easy to violate things like ODR in a way that you can sort of get away with until you change compilers or linkers or build systems, if you change the order that your .o files appear on the link line, right, things explode, right? And then suddenly you don't get away with it anymore, right? That is not the language being rude and brutal. That is, you were doing it wrong because no one actually sat down to tell you how the language works and what we are prioritizing. Let's try another one. ADL gets scary when we talk about upgrading between library versions. ODR gets scary when we talk about someone doing clever and not building from source properly. And how about one that is a matter of both backwards compatibility and performance? We will talk a little bit about ABI. I hate all of the three-letter acronyms so much. They are so scary. For instance, I'm building a plugin API for my new application framework, and I want to pass a collection of properties. So maybe I'm going to want to pass something like this an unordered map of string to any. What is the practical limitation, uh, practical implication of doing something like that? Among other things, the algorithm for std hash of std string must now be fixed for the duration of that plugin API. The lookup strategy for std unordered map must never change. The memory layout for unordered map, string, and std any must similarly never change for the duration that I support that plugin API. I may never be able to upgrade my compiler again. And that's a little scary, right? Because in the last three months, I've seen three, three, I've seen research reports from three separate individual experts and two major corporations, both Facebook and Google, on how to get massively better performance out of hash containers, right? Both changing the probing algorithms, changing the packing structure, uh, interaction with your hash functions, Right? I've got reason to believe that reasonable workloads can be improved by tens of percentage points in CPU with less overall memory consumption. Right? But now, because we decided on that as our plugin API, we've chosen by accident to re rely on one particular compilation of unordered map, std hash, std string, std any. If hashing research continues and we get better and better at vectorizing hash table operations, which is what we're doing these days, you won't be able to use any of that. And in fact, you are already in that world. Right? Your standard library vendors have all agreed to prioritize binary compatibility going back as far as possible over potential performance improvements. So here we went from, I might pass a standard library type between binaries that were built at different times to I can no longer apply recent research or optimization to my hash containers. And that is pretty fundamental 
and scary because we're talking about ABI. ABI as an overview is sort of comparable to plug and port design or sender and receiver design. There's sort of two like parts to this equation, right? The first sort of the physical connection is the name mangling. These are the names that the linker uses to resolve symbols, right? Anything that changes the mangled name of a symbol will cause an ABI break, right? You cannot plug a US plug into an Australian outlet. Uh, relevant. Um, <laughs> Since mangling isn't standardized, right, there's some variation between vendors. Uh, for instance, I happen to know for horrible reasons that MSVC doesn't mangle variadic templates specially. So changing from a foo of T to a foo of variadic, no, to a, one that takes a variadic number of Ts, uh, is totally compatible on Windows. Uh, all existing foo of T will mangle to the same thing uh, as it would in the future. Um, but Clang and GCC share a mangling scheme that encodes variadic templates slightly different than non-variadic templates, and thus is unwilling to accept a change like that to widen. Uh, existing compiling code would stop linking. On the other hand, there's the semantics of the communication, how the bits are laid out and interpreted. The simplest part of that is, does the size of this object change, which I think we could all understand is clearly going to be a break, uh, but more subtly, if the interpretation of the same sequence of bits varies between two builds, then passing an object built under one schema uh, to a receiver that was built to expect a different schema is obviously not going to work. Right? Uh, in a really simple form, you can imagine changing the type but not the size of your class members. Right? You could implement string in, with either of these representations. A string object built under one of these representations it's represented in memory as three words worth of bits with a certain meaning. And a string object built under the other is also three words worth of bits with a completely different meaning. The type has the same name, mangles the same, has the same API, but you've changed the implementation details. Precompiled code is not going to work across such a change. And also this is going to be really hard to debug. So going back to hash containers, right? if the mapping from T to hash code changes, if std hash changes, then we won't be able to rehash a given object and identify the object in the container. Uh, if the interpretation of the hash code by the container changes in terms of where it probes and packs, uh, then we also won't be able to find the object again. And if the bookkeeping data in the hash object uh, changes in representation or layout, then we're also horribly broken. For comparison, the last time that C++ as a whole had a major ABI break was in C++ 11. The implementation and representation of std string on most platforms changed in a way that wasn't binary compatible with older code. This caused endless frustration and queries about what is going on, why doesn't my code work, which continue to this day. Maintainers of all of the standard libraries quite reasonably want to avoid repeating that. On this one, Visual Studio might be ahead of the game they haven't promised binary compatibility in general, historically, and upgrading from one version to another often caused binary incompatibility in the standard library. The community might not understand why that's there or what that means, but they do sort of understand that libraries built with one version won't work with libraries built against a different version. Microsoft is trying these days to break things less frequently, which is good for users. It's good in the short term. Uh, I'm not so sure that letting you all pretend that you have a stable platform forever is the right choice. Anyway, that's a 10,000 foot summary of the scary three letter issues, ADL, ADL, ODR, ABI. If you really knew, if you know all of this going into this talk, that's great, awesome. For the rest of you, I'm willing to put money that your project is built on a house of cards. Hardly anybody knows all of these issues, much less understands how much they are paying for them in terms of mystery bugs, performance that their standard library cannot grant them, uh, or surprising costs when upgrading between versions of the language or even just compiler versions. And because of the various ways that people are depending on this behavior, the committee won't fix it because it can't be done without breaking all of the existing code including the aforementioned, it's done, don't touch, legacy code. For some of these things, we're stuck, right? 
ODR, like I said, is going to be the dominant paradigm until we move to modules. Amusingly, the ability to do so and the need to do so is sort of crux in the committee arguments about modules for the past few years. There are things existing code does that we don't want to allow in the future, but if we don't allow those things, then we can't get people off of legacy onto modules, and that is a pretty rough choice to make. It is maybe not surprising that we have some difficulty deciding which direction to jump, although I hear that we've hammered out a decent compromise. For other things, the choices that we make are entirely self-inflicted and practical. Like, I don't think anything in the C++ standard actually says, we will promise you ABI compatibility. Right? That is coming from the vendors. Right? We've learned as a community that breaking backwards compatibility for pre-compiled code is a thing that people don't deal with very well. I suspect that this is mostly because people don't understand everything that goes into ABI compatibility and haven't really been told what they are giving up in order to achieve that. But let me be extremely clear here. The extent to which the implementers of the compilers and standard libraries, et cetera, adhere to ABI compat is absolutely holding back the language. If we could get y'all to rebuild regularly, you would get better performance. I guarantee it. Also, you would have less exposure to ODR and the whole assert problem, so you could get better performance and fewer impossible to diagnose mystery bugs in exchange for needing to invest in some build farm infrastructure. That sounds to my mind like the type of thing that a CTO really ought to sign off on. Maybe I'm wrong. And then we come to my favorite of these three terrors, ADL. Here is an email that I sent to the language evolution list back in August. Literally a majority of my day has been spent discussing ways to turn off ADL. There are at least three credible proposals floating around to harm the design of common, standard, uh, common libraries, standard, abseil, boost, in serious ways to get ADL to stop triggering. I expect there to be a paper on let's make everything in STUD into non-functions so that ADL stops over triggering. I've had an hour worth of discussion today on every library should have a separate internal namespace for all of its functions versus all of its types, and then add using directives or the like so that they look like they're one thing. I've heard several people say that every file should have its own namespace so that we can get ADL to shut up. All of these options are going to provide a very poor user experience. Compiler diagnostics will worsen. The ability for non-gurus to write in a proper style will drop, and people will not understand why we are doing what we are doing. Can we please make a way for ADL to be opt-in? I'm pretty sure that I represent the majority of librarians when I say ADL needs to work for operators. That is what it was designed for. It needs to work for swap and other non-member extension points, and a very small handful of extension points that are designed for ADL. This isn't a request to only stop supporting namespace lookup on template parameters. This is a full-on request to stop making calls ambiguous, and those calls have no business triggering ADL in the first place. Or the down-thread summary of that, if the librarians in your language are starting to recommend that we stop writing functions, that should be a warning sign. I am conveying that warning. Other library people, like from Bloomberg, chimed in later with things like, yeah, our style guide says use classes full of static functions instead of free functions at namespace scope because that doesn't trigger ADL. Uh, Eric Niebler from Ranges has been ensuring that all of the callables in Ranges don't get specified in such a way as to force them to be functions because functions are broken in the face of ADL. What would it take to make ADL less aggressive? Here's a wild idea. Half-baked, totally half-baked, I admit, right? We declare that in C++23, ADL will not be used in non-generic code, except for operators, and also for functions that explicitly add a keyword or an attribute or something that says, this should be available to be called via ADL. In a C++20 mode, we can pretty easily identify every unqualified function call where ADL is involved and qualify it, right? Uh, the compiler knows what is being called. We can just say, hey, compiler, tell me what is being called so that I can add, you know, foo colon colon to that function call, right? Then no more ADL, poof, right? That's why it has to be non-generic. Um, we can also have to add into C++20 the keyword or attribute or whatever that, so that we can preemptively mark all of those things as extension points, 
um, but that's not too bad. And it's obviously a no-op in C++20 mode. Right? Just doing this would go a long way towards resolving the problem. Because remember, right now if we want to actually be safe, we need bonkers rules like that. Right? If we can get the workaday programmer that is writing regular functions to not worry about bizarre nonsense rules like that, as we try to upgrade between language versions or between boost versions or between abseil versions, right, that would be a huge step in the right direction. Right? People that write templates and generics and all of that regularly won't be helped. But there's already sort of a different dialect that you have to write in order to produce generics properly. But what about all of the legacy code, right? There's two or three Googles worth of C++ code that works fine and won't ever be changed. How much of that is depending on ADL one way or another, intentionally or unintentionally? All of it, I don't even have to look. I don't have to know what it is. I know how often ADL is triggering and it's all of it. So if we make that change, all of that code will break unless it is updated. If that code has to build in mixed modes, like in a 23 mode and in an 11 mode, that'll be annoying, right? If there's some legal or contractual reason that that code cannot be touched, that's gonna be a big hurdle. Code that may very well not have changed at all in 25 years may stop building or may change meaning. So what's the answer? This is obviously the point in the talk where you're Brilliant, charming speaker says, and then I had an aha moment, and there's a simple and retrospect solution. Nah. No such luck. This is fundamentally the most difficult issue facing C++ right now. Right? This is, should the committee allow changes to the language such that code that worked fine in 98, 11, 14, 17 stops working in the future? How much annoyance and fragmentation can the language handle? We don't have an obviously correct answer here. We have what we've done, what we know is safe, and a lot of opinions. Personally, I'm pretty sure that we can bear more frustration during these upgrades than we're subjecting people to intentionally right now. Consider, if you will, how much work and frustration you've got when you're moving between two things that are on the tin supposed to be compatible, right? You switch from GCC to Clang without changing language versions, right? That in theory, is a no-op, right? Has anyone actually had that be a no-op? Do you have more than 10 lines of code, <laughs> right? Uh, <coughs> excuse me. It's not usually free or cheap or easy to do such a thing, right? I believe, my argument is, I cannot prove, that if we make changes to language <laughs> versions carefully and intentionally, and we do so in a way that is highly toolable, like qualifying non-generic code that's being invoked via ADL is, highly toolable, then we can drag all of that legacy along with us. I mean, it seems clear to me, right? If we designed our changes carefully and had magically good tooling, then you could run a tooling step over the legacy code as if it were a preprocessor and continue to use that legacy code unchanged in C++23 and beyond. But that is just my opinion, right? It is a risk to head down that path. Maybe we can't predict how hard a change will be to adopt. Maybe the tooling can't be built. Maybe people just do too much weird stuff in templates and macros and we can't meaningfully touch or upgrade any of the important legacy. This position of mine is certainly not universal on the committee. These types of discussions, I can usually get the committee to agree in theory to breaking backwards compatibility intentionally and carefully and with toolability. But in practice, we seem pretty th stuck on keeping things stable or actually allegedly keeping things stable. If anyone else in the room has upgraded to 17 and didn't have any trouble with the removal of stood random shuffle, I would love to hear about it. That has been a real thorn for us. Uh, when the committee follows through on removing APIs that are slated for deprecation, they aren't doing that with much or any discussion of how hard it is in practice to move off of the thing. Certainly no experience reports. In the case of random shuffle, this is a thing that takes uh, iterator range and shuffles it. Uh, in theory, you can replace any call to random shuffle to a call of shuffle that takes the same iterator range and a bit generator so that you know where your random, your entropy source is. Uh, unless, of course, you've got code that is depending on the exact sequence of random numbers that is output, 
which would never happen. Uh, but if that does happen, in theory, then you're in for a world of hurt. Um, it's bad. Alternately, it is entirely possible that I am just flat out wrong, just talking out my hat. It could well be that if we decide to prefer future code over past code, that we put out a version of C++ that is so hard to move to that we fracture the community entirely and kill the language. Other languages have tried this poorly, and it has gone bad. Right? That would be a bad outcome. Right? We should definitely be avoiding that. Another simpler, maybe more abstract, maybe more punchy way to look at all of this is maybe just look at the slogans and sayings on both sides. Right? We can first ask, what is C++ about? The majority of answers, the things that I've already seen talked about at this conference are C++ is the language that leaves no room for a more efficient language between it and the hardware. In C++, you do not pay for what you do not use. In some respects, these are saying the same thing, but both phrasings of it are important. Right? I believe in these things. On the other hand, there are things that advise us what happens when we don't make changes. Right? If you've seen other talks of mine, I always talk about Hiram's Law. With a sufficient number of users, every observable of your system will be depended upon by someone. We have two million users. There's also just the old saying, a rolling stone gathers no moss, and assumed in that a non-rolling stone gathers moss. When we leave things stable, when the rolling stone of ABI and the like don't change, Hiram's law creeps in. Right? This is the thermodynamic truth of software. No matter how well-intentioned and well-informed your programmers are, given enough time, every little crack that you can build a hack into will be relied upon. And given time, that stops being a hack. More and more things get built around it until it is not moss, it is just earth. Changing the ABI once per decade is more frustrating and more expensive than changing the ABI once and then making it so that it is impossible for people to depend on it in ways that we don't necessarily want to promise. So that's where we are. It's a fallible group of about 150 people discussing and debating whether, in theory, we should prioritize stability over velocity. It's a minor preference in the committee for velocity in the abstract. In the concrete, even in the face of librarians are gonna stop writing functions, it is unclear that we have the stomach for any significant change. I believe that the estimate is that there's maybe two million C++ programmers in the world. That's roughly 13,000 per committee member. Do you know who represents you? Does anyone represent you? When was the last time that you talked to a standards member? Who has talked to, sent email to, tweeted with a standards member in the last six months? Yeah, that's 5%, mostly speakers. <laughs> in the end, I prefer the velocity side of this equation. Right? I believe above all else that change must be possible. And if it is, must be possible, it's better to make it easy. The obvious scary story right now is Spectre and speculative execution, right? If you are currently on a compiler that did not come out this year, your code is vulnerable to all sorts of things, right? If you are in a world where it is too expensive for me to upgrade the compiler, you need to also evaluate, is it more expensive than a security breach, right? If you have gotten to the point that you cannot upgrade your compiler, you are betting an existential bet that it will never be necessary to do so. And this year in particular tells us it is. So you'd better get with the program. I understand the position that stability is important, right? It got us where we are. I don't think I have the answers. Right? I know that the committee as a whole doesn't because we have no consensus on any of this. So we should be reaching out to all of you that actually hold those code bases that are maybe stable to actually talk to you about how expensive would it be, how hard would it be for you to adopt such a change? Which would you prefer? It's your language too, right? Do we need to fix our mistakes? Or do we need to prioritize stability above all else? 
and probably slow down the pace of change so that we can be more sure about things. More than just answering the question of stability versus velocity, I want to encourage all of you to get involved. Right? Make your voices heard one way or another. Go to conferences. Good job. Figure out how to participate in standards discussions, or figure out how to participate in the community discussion. Right? Twitter, uh, blog posts. Right? Write up your position piece about something, be it this or whatever. Send it to the isocpp.com blog. Right? Have that reposted there. Follow the isocpp.com blog. Right? We need to actually be a community to be able to answer any of these questions. Right? Uh, if you can't figure out how to participate directly in standards discussions or have someone from your company do so, uh, find committee members that are willing to listen and that can represent your position. Right? These questions facing the language are just far too big for the committee to answer without hearing from all of you. Thank you. Um, about that thing with uh, not making a stable ABI for, for example, hash map. Um, how really important is to have the latest and greatest hash map in the STL? Because um, I don't think anyone assumes STL will have that, right? So if my... I guess we could ans ask that question. Before today, who thought that unordered map would give you good performance? That is half the hands, including speakers. So I think that's, that's the probably best. false. The best in, you know, the best performance. I didn't even say I mean, best. De I said good. Yeah, good performance. Sure, it does that already. But the best performance. Actually, I think it demonstrably doesn't. Like, the way that an ordered map is specified forces at least one completely unnecessary cache miss. Sure, I, I agree. So then making it, making a stable ABI at the expense of not having the latest and greatest, wouldn't that be a win? So being able to pass STD type between... It's the types between uh, you know, DLLs or to a binary application that you don't have to source to, you're just making plugins for. And stuff there like are that. ways to do both. Like, it is entirely possible to have defined, at this moment, this is the ABI for things with a like, legacy mangling. Right? If you name all of the binary names of those things, if you cause the mangled name to not be stood on ordered map, but stood legacy unordered map, right? Then any code that is built against the legacy thing, like you can tweak it with uh, inline namespaces and things so that like you're API compatible and you produce that mangled name if, that's, if the legacy is what you need. And you can have a standard library that contains both like a legacy binary implementation that is not gonna be the latest and greatest and a current, right? Like, it is possible. Like, you're going to have kookier compile times, more confusing things, uh, sizes of linker inputs is going to go up a whole bunch. Um, but, like, these are not insurmountable things. And if we actually go back to just, like, discussing, let's specify the ABI for some things, uh, we could be in a much better shape. Like, one of the things that comes up that is frustrating, actually, going back to playing the game, right? Unique pointer. Uh, my horrifying answer for unique pointer is, use unique pointer, don't listen to the rest of this. Um, <laughs> there is a minor overhead on using unique pointer uh, because when you pass it uh, through, pass it by value to transfer ownership the way that you're supposed to, uh, the, we didn't specify anything special about the ABI, and so the destructor of the moved from unique pointer still has to be executed and you can actually find that in traces. Um, whereas we know for sure, like, you know, you moved it, it's, it's done, it's fine, right? Like if we looked a little lower and like talked about ABI specification, the calling convention could have said, yeah, don't worry about that. Um, and, you know, we have the flexibility, we could do things like this, but we haven't thought of it ahead of time ever yet. And we're deeply afraid of making any change to ABI. I've been saying for three or four years in committee meetings, like, okay, at some point we're gonna have to do this again. I'm keeping a list of all of the things. 
we should plan on this being like every 10 years. I would love it if we planned on after the next one, it stops being painful. Uh, so far, there seems to be no belief in my position. I'm, uh, I'd give you 50-50 that at some point some specter speculative execution thing requires a change to uh, calling convention or ABI in other ways. And then we're going to have a whole lot of fun. So as a, a relatively new C++ developer, I'm learning about all these three-letter acronyms with just dread uh, that I've screwed something up somewhere along the right way, almost definitely. I definitely uh, have so much. So what, if I go back to my code base tomorrow, what, uh, how can I detect these problems? What tooling is out there to, to let me find where I've screwed up? Um, I think the most important one is ODR. And there's an increasing amount of uh, stuff in sanitizers that will detect at least the, early, like the basic easy forms of ODR, uh, I think. Uh, I've heard rumors of such. I haven't used it uh, myself, partly because internally we just build everything from source with the same flags all the time, so slightly less common. Um, for other things like you have a declaration of this variable in a header, those things are statically detectable, but we haven't traditionally done so. Um, and I think there's a lot of room for Clang Tidy and other things to actually catch those problems statically. And I think there might also be a little bit of that going on. I'm not sure. Don't, I won't promise. Um, for ABI, I've heard rumors of there being tools that check to make sure that once, when you build a library, the set of mangled symbols that is present uh, stays the same. Um, that doesn't necessarily catch everything, because that's only the physical part, not the semantic part. Right? You can't do both. It's very hard to test for you haven't changed the semantics of things. Um, and for uh, ADL, uh, I know that that is all statically detectable. I think that we have added uh, don't, like, for absale, one of the uh, compatibility rules is please don't call absale functions via ADL, uh, specifically because it will make it harder for us to do any maintenance, but also because some of our types are effectively polyfills for uh, C17 vocabulary. And your build will break when you call us via ADL and then that stops being an absolute type, it becomes a standard type. Anyway, long story. Uh, there's, I think, uh, Clang Tidy checks either in, uh, committed to Clang Tidy, probably in the absolute branch, uh, and those checks need to be expanded to uh, cover all of std because of SD8. Um, SD8, I mentioned briefly, is standing document eight is a new document that is public facing, it's not in standard ease, and it is, these are the list of things that the committee reserves the right to do when we are making changes in the future, including adding new functions, which the side effect of that is don't rely on, or don't make unqualified calls. Um, and so I think an increasing amount of the side effects of SD8 has room for clang tidy checks. Um, I'm trying to fund some of that, and since Clang Tidy is open source, anyone that's hacking on Clang Tidy things or looking for Clang Tidy projects to cut your teeth on, it's a great place to start. Send me an email, I'm happy to talk about it. Uh, but none of those is a panacea by any means. Like, honestly, your best answer is study up, understand what these things are, like, get a intuition for it, and take code review seriously. <laughs> so that you can spot these when other people are doing it. Thank you so much. Um, <coughs> so three things, two statements, I guess, and then the final question. Uh, first is internally when I was uh, coaching, mentoring people and building libraries and so forth, uh, it took a long time for them to really understand the fully qualified name thing so that the library would continue to work in the face of changing standards and blah, blah, blah. Doesn't even have to be fully qualified? There's a terminology 
just Colin Colin. Just yeah. if you're going to be using the standard whatsoever. one, just Colin Colin. Yep. Uh, and they were, these are extra characters. Why do we even need this? Blah, blah, blah. And it was a very difficult argument to finally get them to understand it. Yeah. Uh, until we had our own multiple namespace overloading and blah blah blah. And yeah. Anyway, the other thing was the ABI stuff uh, in the face of old libraries that we had to build with we ended up choosing C interface all the time for mm -hmm. our DLLs. Yep. That was fine. Uh, and then other times we had to use COM because I was a Windows programmer and yeah. so on. Okay, it and, worked. And I think it worked, all right? Yeah. Across 32-bit, 64-bit boundaries and stuff, we had yeah. to do all sorts of wonderful stuff, but it worked. Yeah, totally. And, and I it, think and C And it lasted actually... the test of time because we had one product using one library that was built and then another product using another, and we could actually make them communicate with each other and we could upgrade them separately and it worked. Right. It worked. Yeah. And we're, <laughs> as it turns out, we're not going to change the um, layout or semantics of int. <laughs> Thank you. So, like C APIs make perfect sense. Oh, so good. <laughs> So the last question, or the actual question, has anybody actually considered having a transforming ABI level namespace f definition for studded string and a few other standard things so that people can write a minimum, at least a minimum library spec thing that could last yeah. time? Um, so that if you had a studded string with those different layouts, you could have the ABI one that you want to yeah. hand out and it just transforms it on the fly as necessary and then you can, you can buy that compatibility. Yeah, I believe that Herb has a proposal, an old proposal along those lines, in fact, that people didn't care about and I am making enough noise that uh, I've heard that it might be getting revisited. And I think Sean had a comment along. Oh, yeah. No? Not a comment, but a question, yeah. so go oh, ahead and okay. finish your statement. Um, uh, so maybe, um, like part of what I'm doing, like cards on the table, right? My goal here is to scare all of you and get you to speak up and participate, right? Like what is it that you need? Like what do you want from us? Because 150 people cannot represent 2 million without hearing from you. So please contact your committee members. So first, uh, thank you. Your the section of your talk talking about building everything from source. I'm going to put that on a loop, and it's going to be in like every monitor in the company. Um, uh, and your entire talk here is going to be required viewing. So the standards committee at one point added inline namespaces, mm -hmm. and that was partly as a tool for platform vendors to allow them to version libraries. Mm -hmm. Uh, and not break ABI compatibility when updating libraries. Uh, the standard committee has been reluctant to take that far enough to actually standardize on what the inline namespaces are so that users can, can write portable code that selects a version of the standard library. Okay. Uh, uh, I would suggest that that is one possible way to start moving forward, both from a library standpoint but also to introduce a similar versioning mechanism to the language itself. So when you talk about uh, there are tooling, you know, it would be easy to solve this problem with tooling. Uh, that usually means, you know, because the compiler knows what the old rules were. Well, the compiler will continue to know what the old rules were. So if you have a way to scope when the new rules apply, you should be able to mix and match the code. Yeah. Um, uh, you know modulo macros and a huge number yeah. of sharp edges. Uh, uh, but those things might start to be solvable through modules and other mechanisms. Yeah. And so, so, you know, I would like to see the language evolve more aggressively. Uh, and I think one way to do that is to, to introduce a versioning mechanism. Yeah, I largely agree. Um, the argument against that I've heard most regularly uh, is uh, we don't want there to be dialects. Like everything needs to be like continuum, and at some point that's going to fail, right? Like 
I think, I think one way potentially to mitigate that is to not to mandate how far back a particular vendor goes. And so, so the idea yeah. is it becomes uh, uh, you know, unstated that you know, the versioning mechanism is there and the versioning mechanism supplies, but what version a particular vendor chooses to support and how far back they, they go, uh, basically everything prior to, to N, right, N minus one is considered deprecated. Yeah, and, and especially in the face of having good tools to help like push the bulk of things along, like we can get there. And the tools, like compiler-based tools for refactoring are increasingly magical, right? We have done unfathomable things in Google's code base, right? Like the public-facing bits of Absale are a tiny, tiny fraction of uh, the work that the Absale project has done because we have literally refactored the most common, most important libraries that a quarter of a billion lines of code relies on, right, to change all of the namespaces, to fix up, like, orders of things, to fix names of things, right, to move all of this code into a different part of the repository, like, live, while 12,000 people are working that code base, and we just do that, right? I'm probably the only human on the planet that has, uh, reviewed 100,000 changes. Um, and that's largely because I'm the approver for this massive flood of automatic refactoring work. And it's totally doable, right? Uh, but the problem is when I go to the committee and I tell stories like this, they're like, nah, y'all have magic. We don't actually believe you. No one else can do that. <laughs> Which I'm like, on the one hand, yeah, I understand that like we're pushing and a little bit ahead of the curve, but I think everyone is gonna want to come along, right? And so I also encourage y'all, go play with the tools. Go see how it works. Go improve the tools. Don't regard your code base as so out of date and broken that it can't be worked on, right? Everything is possible. Change must be possible. Um, I love Google SRE has a phrase, no haunted graveyards, which means there must not be production systems that you are afraid to touch, right? Because that means you have lost. Uh, no haunted graveyards applies in your code base too, right? If there are things that you're like, I cannot touch this, it will fall over. You have already fallen over, you just don't know it, right? Like, no haunted graveyards. Thanks for the talk. Um, just one small comment on the tooling part of the question before. Mm -hmm. uh, link time optimization turns out to be a good way to catch ODR violations. Thank you. Again, it depends on whether or not the optimizer has like constant folded things and like there is some room for that at link time optimization, yeah, but uh, simple cases. <laughs> and not necessarily like, I have defined this class template with two slightly different versions in different translation units. Like LTO is not, I think, going to be able to identify that. Uh, yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, what kind of uh, developments or tentative developments coming in like the next version of the language do you think are promising in, in the language or the ecosystem? Uh, with respect to this or just generally? Uh, generally. Uh, I'm super excited with the Rangers work. Um, the ranges work actually sort of touches on this because um, famously uh, I killed stood two. There was a notion that we were going to land all of the ranges in STD two, uh, and no, you can't do that. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of redesign. The two, like the existing standard library and, and the ranges version, the rangeified version of things, can coexist. There's a nice, like, mutually acceptable, like, overlap. Uh, and the places where there's differences, like, especially in the algorithms, those live in stood ranges. Um, and my goal is to give talks like this and get everyone to adopt tooling and understand that change must be possible and, like, stop having this argument about, oh, my code from 25 years ago still works. Blah, blah, blah. Um, and I would like over I don't know, the rest of my career, uh, to get to the point where we can tool everyone away from 
the existing calls to std algorithms, to make them call std ranges with high fidelity and high accuracy, and then introduce std legacy and move all of the existing algorithms into std legacy and promote std ranges down. This is obviously at least three and probably more like five standard releases required to do that. And I don't give myself high odds, but the design is actually compatible with such a plan, and like, I'm excited and pleased about that. Um, the other things, like modules, coroutines, are both going to be transformative and wonderful in a lot of ways. They will also undoubtedly have some wonderful answers in the game. Um, I can think of a couple already, but um, all in all, I think C++20 is shaping up to be a, uh, a bigger, like, meaty sort of release. Um, personally, I thought C++17 had a ton of very, very valuable language imp uh, library improvements in particular, and a lot of things that made, like, quality of life changes uh, in very valuable ways. <coughs> Oh, I, I don't believe the like, yeah, 17 was not big enough. Uh, I think 17 was great, but 20 will satisfy many people, I think. Um, yeah, so one of the reasons why ADL is kind of a difficult issue is because customization points in the standard are kind of ugly. Oh, yeah. Is there any way, is there any like kind of proposal to make customization points for standard library functions more consistent or anything yeah. like that? Um, in fact, the customization points. Uh, one of the, we're not sure we're gonna go down this path, pieces of landing the ranges work is to change the important customization points in the library to specifically be, uh, like for swap and begin and end and, and the like, uh, to not require that you invoke them via ADL. Uh, they will do it themselves by virtue of being a customization point object, um, which is some, funny implementer trickery. Um, and the downside to this is if a user has specialized std swap for their type, then this wouldn't trigger. That is not the way that you're supposed to use swap. You are supposed to implement swap in your namespace for your type, and then it triggers via ADL. Um, and so it's unclear what the scope of the breakage would be, how hard it is to fix the breakage, and whether or not we care, because you're not supposed to have done that in the first place. Um, but knowing the committee as a whole, I'm guessing that there will be a lot of wailing and gnashing of teeth, and we might, we might chicken out. So I don't know. Um, but yeah, like, we have very good people working on it. Not me. Quick one with regard to the ADL tooling for looking for the actual function being called. Mm -hmm. uh, is it part of the idea to also list the other ones that would be good matches so that you can see which one that you actually wanted? Um, tooling works best when it is, does not require any human intervention. Um, and so in this particular case, it would, like the easy and obvious and correct thing would be qualify that in a way so that it calls the thing it was calling. Uh, it is not hard to build additional things to say, this is the ADL set. My suspicion is that will probably turn out not to be useful, but actually, here's the question. How many of you have uh, code that lives in the global namespace? That is about two thirds, I think. Yeah, that's kind of what I feared. Um, <coughs> the global namespace is wild <laughs> when you get ADL involved. Um, and so it, I strongly suspect that in a majority of cases, the set of things that is actually available via ADL is not useful to show you mm -hmm. uh, because so much is being implicated. Was that? It's an ordered set, best match. Uh, yes, like ordered set, best match, like, yeah. And the best match is the one that's actually being called, but. Um, maybe. Uh, in my experience, there's an awful lot of, there's way more ADL happening than you like might think. Like, I'm not joking when I say, like, 
the professional librarians, in my experience, complain more about ADL than anything else. Um, flaky tests are a distant, like, third. It's probably SWIG is second. <laughs> SWIG was a bad idea, don't do SWIG. So I was just wondering about the ABI thing. Um, you seem to be advocating very infrequent ABI changes. Is there a reason why you wouldn't say, no. why, why just go every year or every six months or every compiler release? Um, so Hiram's law is the thermodynamic truth of software, right? If you make it something that someone can depend on, they will. Um, my preferred option is for the ABI to be probably randomized between invocations of the compiler. Um, that, that's <laughs> certainly the way I would look at it. <laughs> right? Like, yeah. <laughs> I'm with you on that. <laughs> right. Um, and in practice, like anything, is, it's going to have to be a little bit more limited just because of the reality of the situation. Um, but like there's a direct comparison to hashing, right? Uh, all of the good hash table implementations that you will find, uh, you cannot write a unit test that accidentally depends on, like, I put these three things into my hash table, and they came out when I iterated it in this order. Right? You cannot write that, I mean, you can write that test. That test is going to fail two thirds of the time uh, because all of the high quality hash implementations these days aggressively make sure that they randomize per uh, invocation, either process or sometimes compiler, one or the other, um, specifically so that they reserve the right to change the hash function and to change probing and all of those things in the future, right? Without making it impossible to depend on something, people are going to depend on it. You don't want them to, but they do. Um, and so like my, I hope no one on the committee can argue with me is we need to plan for it to be every 10 years. Uh, my, I could wave a magic wand and have my wish would be like, it's happening like every seven milliseconds, right? Like, so, yeah. So one problem, uh our company has, and I know Google had it at least a, when I was there, so that was almost a decade ago now, uh, is people who take a library, Zlib is a common example, uh, they pull it down from the web, they fork it, uh, they don't change the namespace, they build it into their DLL, and they don't export the symbols and they think they're safe. Right. And what they don't realize is that C++ kind of leaks like a sieve, uh, uh, that they've got uh, uh, potentially um, RTTI information that's leaking, they've got exception information that's relying on RTTI that's leaking, exception tables are leaking, uh, and they have really, 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 really subtle bugs they've introduced that will probably bite them a week before the ship and I'll go get on a plane and fly to wherever they are and debug it for them. And exceptions have ABIs. <laughs> yes, exceptions have ABIs, uh, and people don't know that. And RTTI has an ABI, and people don't know that. Um, uh, how do you fight against that? Uh, uh, what is the current state at Google to combat that? At one point at Google, I wrote a document that explained this problem when we were working on Chrome OS, because it, 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 it existed and it was big within the Google code base. Multiple yep. versions of the same library, same namespace, same symbols used in different places. Um, I think the single most important thing for resolving that has been uh, a little bit cultural and a little bit technical. And the technical part is, I guess, straightforward-ish of uh, wild spending on build infrastructure, right? There should be no reason for someone to prioritize, I'm only going to build my part instead of depend on the common bit. Um, like, we just, if you take, like, keep my build more isolated off the table, a lot of people stumble into better behavior. That helps a bit. And the other one has been uh, an aggressive shift towards professional librarians and a clearer uh, contract between providers and consumers of an API. Um, I think it's illustrative. Uh, one of the reasons that someone would do that is because 
they don't want to be forced to upgrade to the new version of Zlib at some random time when someone else decides to update it. Right? And what we've done is change it so that uh, when you are the owner of an API, be it a third party API or a first party thing, uh, it is your responsibility to upgrade all of the users of your thing if you are making a change. And fundamentally, I think that is the only thing that actually scales because uh, one, it ensures that the new thing is not so different that it's impossible to like make that change incrementally. And two, it like now that we have 40,000 engineers or whatever, if every team had the right to make changes to their APIs and force people to react to it, the people in the leaves of that graph are going to be running full tilt just to keep their build from breaking. Right? That, that can't possibly be the right way for us to spend our resources. Whereas when you have experts that understand exactly what the semantics of the change are, or usually it's just syntax of the change are, uh, and at this point, have a lot of experience executing broad changes that are hopefully sem syntactic, I'm sorry, semantic no-ops, uh, it is a whole lot easier to just make huge fire hose of textual update to be like, name of that function changed. Dunk, done, move on. Oh, and now everyone is compatible with the new version of Zlib, flip the bit. Right? And everyone's code just updates like silently and automatically. And if you fork it and do it yourself, you're going to be left behind because it's all compiler-based tooling. If you're relying on a different version of that thing, like eh, you're on your own. And I think the two of those things together have sort of silently made it just a whole lot less of an issue. Um, regarding the um, uh, making ADL opt-in uh, ID, do you expect it to be better to make uh, a function declaration declared as find me by ADL or to tag explicit calls to function to say uh, we want to trigger ADL here or both of those? Um, I think the, first off, I am not a language design person. I am a library design person. So anytime that we're talking about like changing call lookup and like how to change the language and the grammar and uh, all, like, I'm guessing. I mean, this is not my area of expertise. Um, that said, I'm pretty sure that it's going to be much better if, for instance, std swap is tagged as if you resolve to this function template, uh, then additionally do ADL lookup. I think that is going to be easier, more intentional, clearer, and less churn overall. And I don't actually care all that much about churn, but like as a minor note, like I think that's also serves to demonstrate. Like yeah, I think this is probably a better choice. Uh, you um, recommended that we uh, talk to committee members, make our views heard. Uh, how would you recommend we go about finding sympathetic committee members? Uh, could, could all sympathetic committee members put their hands up? <laughs> Christabella, Dean, and I think the two of you might have a scheme about Australia. Yes, uh, if you're interested and you're based in Australia or want to be involved, uh, reach out to us after at some point in time when we're not completely busy, uh, either via IM, whatever, in person, and we'll be happy to represent your views. So. Or if you want to be on the uh, national, uh, we're, we're trying to set up uh, Australian standards representation for C++. So if you're interested and want to be on that, then please do that. Uh, contact me or uh, Chris DeBella for that. Sure. Um, otherwise, I cannot promise to answer every email. Um, I'm happy to you know try. I'm happy to talk to people at conferences and talks and all of those things. Um, there is a increasingly active, well, maybe not increasingly, there's a very active like C++ Twitter community that at least half of the active participants are committee members. Um, and also I think very important to remember, the committee is not like an invite thing. It's not like, hey, 
we've <coughs> recognized that you're actually amazing. And the committee is, we've published a paper to say where the committee is meeting. Did you show up? Right, if you go a bunch of times, then there may start to be discussions of you should pay dues. But like, if you just wanna show up once, like, show up, it's totally fine, right? Um, because all of us, you know, no one knows all of it. And everyone has, hopefully, some important, you know, information and signal and opinion on a lot of things. Um, so yeah, you're, you know, everyone is welcome to just show up. Um, yeah, so you're heading SG15. Yep. Um, so I suppose what is the biggest change that this group being a relatively new one um, and how soon do you think we'll get it? Uh, so SG15 is this study group on tooling, which I got roped into doing about a year ago. My understanding at the time was going to be, oh, Titus always talks about all of this code transformation stuff. Like, we should discuss that. And in practice, it turns out that there's a lot of groundwork that we need to cover before we get there. Uh, so the major things that SG15 is looking at these days seem to be discussions of build systems and package management um, at the point that we get to build systems, package management, uh, and maybe some tooling, then we'll be, or maybe some, like, uh, indexing in particular, I think, uh, we would be in a much better place. Um, I've published kind of a five-year vision that's very committee-focused, I, I recognize. Um, but my sort of five-year mission for SG15 is five years from now, uh, the committee should be able to take a look across all popular open source C++ packages and be able to run compiler-based index queries against all of those to see like, what the impact of a particular change would be. Right? Because right now, cards on the table, uh, for the first couple years that I was at, sitting in Library Evolution, like just as a committee member not sharing, for the first couple years that I was there, the most important thing that I brought to that room, I think, was Google has an index of our code. Right? I can do things that are not regular expression search. I can say, there is a call to dot .get on unique pointer. Show me everywhere in our code base that is calling dot .get on unique pointer. Right? And being able to ask questions at that like compiler level turns out to be kind of important. Uh, because at the moment, there is almost no data going into all of the committee discussions and prioritizations. So I show up with an index and the willingness to say like, we have 10,000 calls to that. That's a little. We have 500,000 calls to that. That means something, right? We have one of those. There are 2,000 instantiations of that. That's nothing. We have one of those types. There's 85,000 instantiations of that. It's meaningful. Right? And just being able to like give those sort of order of magnitude bounds on things has been critical. And in order to do that through like the work of SG15, we need to understand which open source projects are popular, which means we have to probably have a you know, census of open source projects, uh, maybe have an understanding of the dependencies between them, or at least the popularity of them. That's tooling. Uh, we need to be able to understand the build for all of them. Uh, that's build systems, maybe, or build understanding at some level. And then there's being able to actually run an indexer over those things. Right? And if we move to that world, then in a few years, any company that wants their weird sub-dialect to be represented had better be sending an, a uh, representative with an index of their private code <laughs> because we are going to move to evidence based on the average public code. And that is, I think, that is the goal. Like, that is the dream, so. Final like question? Um, yeah, with your uh, automated refactoring at Google, I'm interested, can you give some insight into uh, the process of doing that? And are there any tools out there that we can take advantage of? Clang tidy 
um, I think at this point, a solid fraction of uh, the major refactorings that happen actually just get invoked or get implemented as Clang Tidy plugins. Um, and Clang Tidy, in addition to running static analysis and being like, hey, you have an anti-pattern right here, uh, it can suggest a fix. And so what we've done is, like, y'all don't have quarter a billion line C++ code bases, right? So it's not usually quite as important to be able to invoke Clang Tidy in parallel across all TUs, right? But, you know, figure out how to do Clang Tidy across all of your code base, right? Generate one change. Uh, if it is the case that you are in a code base where you can just submit that, I mean, test it, code review it, make sure it's correct, all of that. Right? Don't skimp, uh, but just submit that. Right? For us, it's a little harder because there's sort of a weird second order thermodynamic problem of uh, you can't actually sync to head a change that's more than about 10,000 files because there's too much change in the background. Uh, you certainly couldn't test one. And even if you could just get it submitted, uh, rolling it back would be the most stressful thing that ever happened, right? And so we tend to do things in a non-atomic refactoring style, uh, which is actually what the committee would have to do as well, because we can't atomically change the world. Um, and that's basically, you introduce a new thing, you find, uh, you generate the conversion to the new thing, and all of the individual pieces of that conversion can be done independently. Right? You commit those in whatever order and whatever sequence that you like, and then when you're down to there's none of them left, then you remove the old thing. Like that that uh, does a lot for us. But Clang Tidy, the underlying like uh, AST matchers and all of that, and there's been some good talks about that. Um, there's a paper that I wrote about general non-atomic refactoring techniques um, that you can probably bing for. Um, yeah, otherwise. Uh, and then, uh, oh, Hiram Wright wrote, a, a gave a good talk at CPPCon this year about a five-year retrospective of us doing these sort of large-scale changes in C++. So just some stuff like that. Thank you all very much.